In September of 2017, I was sitting bedside in an ICU, holding the hand of the love of my life. My girlfriend, Mallory, was on a ventilator, unable to speak. As the anesthesia from her double lung transplant wore off, she frantically motioned to me to get her a pen and pad of paper to write with. Still heavily sedated and in tremendous pain, she found the strength to write me a note that would change me forever. You have so far exceeded my expectation of what is possible for love. Not 48 hours prior, I had said goodbye to Mallory, not knowing if she would make it to the other side of surgery. This note showed me that Mallory, as well as our love, had survived. As Mallory began to recover and soon return home, we began to make plans for our salty, sunny future together, living on the beach, surfing, and raising children. Two months later, Mallory's mother, father, brother, aunt, and I held Mallory as her life slipped away peacefully. When Mallory died, so too did my hopes for our future together and my dreams for our family that we had always dreamed of. I couldn't imagine overcoming my grief. However, relief would come from an unlikely source, from Maui herself, but I would have to wait to get it. Just before Mallory passed, she had given her mother, Diane, a gift, the password to her personal journals, and a request to her mother to publish her words. Writing from the age of 15 until her death at age 25, Mallory often turned to her journal as a way to cope with living with chronic illness. However, for months after Mallory had passed, I wouldn't have access to the journal, as she had asked her mother to, be, to not only publish her words, but also act as the gatekeeper to her unedited thoughts. The challenge of reading over 2,500 pages of journals, omitting any references that might have been said out of anger or that might embarrass her friends, as well as pulling passages that captured the entirety of Mallory's boundless character, was no easy task. And so, while the journals were being edited, I fought to escape my sadness. I tried everything I could think of to distract myself from the loss of Mallory. Swimming in the ocean, a place where I normally felt at home in the waves, suddenly felt so very lonely, knowing that Mallory would never join me there again. Writing in a journal of my own, which helped a little bit, but not as much as I would have hoped. And finally, running from my sadness, literally running up to 30 miles per week. However, the loss of Mallory always seemed to catch up with me. Finally, in the summer of 2018, Mallory's mother and aunt finished the first draft of Mallory's book, asking me to review their work. Mallory's mother pulled me aside and said, Jack, you need to understand how much this has helped me in processing my own grief. And my hope is that by working on this, you can, help, you can process your own grief as well. At first, I was hesitant to read Mallory's words, as I feared how impossibly sad they would make me feel. I was afraid of knowing which of Mallory's hopes and dreams she had for her future would never come to be. And yet, I was also curious. How had the woman that I knew grown into the strong, confident, beautiful woman that I came to know? How was she able to accomplish so much despite living with chronic illness? And so, with a heavy heart, I turned to page one and met Mallory again. Not as I originally had on New Year's Eve in 2015, but a decade before, when Mallory was 15 years old. Mallory was born with a rare genetic disorder called cystic fibrosis. CF is a chronic, progressive, and eventually fatal disease that attacks the lungs, sinuses, and gastrointestinal tract. When Mallory was diagnosed at the age of three, the life expectancy of a CF patient was in their mid to late 20s. Knowing that there was always a clock ticking on her life, Mallory fought hard to achieve her dreams while she could, becoming a three-sport varsity high school athlete, prom queen, and Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Stanford University. However, her outward successes concealed her inner truth about her struggles, a truth revealed in her journal. Mallory was forced to grapple with her mortality from a young age, 
often finding it challenging to find the answers to life's biggest questions when her own life was in so much turmoil. At one moment, she could be living a relatively normal life, going to class, playing sports, and laughing with friends. In the next, she could be back in the hospital, in tremendous pain, isolation, and exhaustion. The cycle was vicious, and in 2012, Mallory was diagnosed with acute depression brought on by months in the hospital. So I still wondered, how had Mallory come to overcome all of these challenges and still turn into the positive woman that I knew? The turning point happened in one of Mallory's darkest moments, at a time when she was feeling particularly overwhelmed. After months of trying everything she could to rid her body of her sickness, nothing seemed to be working. Sapped of energy, Mallory made her way to the beach, which was her happy place. Once she was safely under the waves, Mallory cried, her salty tears mixing with the salt water of the ocean. Suddenly, a turtle swam up to Mallory, gazing upon her with big, dark eyes of compassion. Mallory wasn't spiritual, but in that moment she had an epiphany, realizing for the first time that she did not have the power to rid her body of CF and that she needed to look at herself in the same eyes that the turtle did, with compassion. Mallory wrote in her journal that night, determined, saying, I didn't ask for this illness, but I own it. Because if I don't, no one else will. And that ownership has given me the belief that things can change. That ownership would make all the difference, as Mallory would come to accept the parts of her body she could not change, focusing instead on the things that she could ultimately leading her to, quote, live happy, a mantra that she carried for the rest of her life. Reading Mallory's words were inspiring, and they made me realize that I needed to own the fact that Mallory was gone. I needed to accept that thinking about her loss would never bring her back, and certainly wouldn't make me happy. And so, I took the fateful step to live happy, just like Mallory did. Second only to deciding to date her in the first place, it was the best decision I've ever made. Mallory had one more bit of wisdom to share with us, though. She found that one of the best ways to live happy was to prioritize love whenever possible. Love for your family, love for your friends, and love for that special someone. Mallory found that when you love other people a lot, you come to love life a lot more as well. And so, I got to the hardest part of the journal for me to read, when I read about Mallory loving me. From our tenuous first kiss on the beach to when Mallory's fears of what her declining health would mean for our relationship, her writing ran the gamut of experiences we shared as a couple. Her memories were beautiful, at times hilariously funny, and other times tragically sad. Ultimately, though, they helped me validate every decision I had made in our relationship together, and they made me fall in love with Mallory all over again. After reading the draft, I knew it was perfect, but that's only because I knew the ending already. So when our editor reached out to us saying that she needed someone to fill in the final gaps of Mallory's story, Mallory's mother suggested me. I was honored that she trusted me to write for her daughter when she was unable to write for herself, when Mallory was under the anesthesia of transplant, and when she slipped into a coma and passed away. So. With the impossible task of following Mallory's literary eloquence and grace, I was determined to make her proud. Thankfully, I had the support of friends and family to help edit my words, choosing which ones were worthy of inclusion in Mallory's memoir. Now, I wrote my section of the book having no idea where the book would land, as the plan was originally to self-publish Mallory's words, distributing them to friends, family, and those we knew in the cystic fibrosis community. However, our editor told us that her words were simply too important to self-publish, encouraging us to work with one of the most prestigious publishing houses in the world instead. The publisher went on to call the book, quote, life-changing, and Salt in My Soul, An Unfinished Life by Mallory Smith was published posthumously on March 12th of this year. Mallory's original hope was that her words would bring comfort to those living with or loving someone with chronic illness. They have done that now and so much more. Now a source of inspiration to thousands around the world, I could barely contain my pride when Mallory's book became a bestseller. My only wish was that she was here to see it. 
Mallory's example of overcoming great adversity and still finding a way to live happy despite it has been an inspiration and has meant so many different things to so many different people. As for me, I know that Mallory would want me to remember the love we shared, to own the loss that I cannot change, and she would want me to move on, to prioritize finding new love in my own quest to live happy, just like she did. My hope with you today is that by hearing Mallory's words and the change her story has affected in people, myself included, that you'll be inspired to change things in your life as well, to look upon yourself with compassion, owning the parts of your body or your past that you cannot change, and instead focusing on the things that you can while prioritizing love whenever possible. Then maybe your life can be filled with as much love and happiness as Mallory's was. Thank you.